Hello, and welcome to Apparel's Web Connection Series. Today's session is entitled, Made in USA, an Industry Talent and Skills Gap Assessment. I'm Jordan Spear, Editor-in-Chief of Apparel, and I'll be serving as your moderator. I'd like to thank our sponsor of today's event, Alvinon. If you're listening today, there's a good chance you're one of many people struggling to find the right talent to fill job openings at your company. Why? Because the rapid pace of technological change has run roughshod over the traditional skills taught in high schools and universities, demanding different and usually greater skills in almost every area of industry. We've grown accustomed to hearing about how technology has eliminated jobs, particularly in manufacturing. And while this is true, the more important and interesting story is that technology has created different jobs. The problem is that we, as a country, do not have a workforce educated sufficiently to take on these jobs. Today's jobs require new skill sets, and U.S. manufacturers need to get ahead of the problem. Today's discussion has its roots in a recent wide-ranging survey conducted by Alvinon on the state of skills in the apparel industry, and it will address the steps that U.S. apparel businesses are taking and need to take to ensure that their workforces are fit for the future. This is an issue crucial to the health of apparel in all industries, and the stakes are high. As the sourcing manager at Carter's put it, we are in a war for talent. We're lucky to have Ed Gribben with us today to dig into some of the results of the survey and put some perspective on this issue. Ed is a veteran of this industry. He is currently the senior advisor to Alvinon, a fashion innovations company, shaping the future of fit in the global fashion industry. He is considered a leading global authority on fashion sizing and fit and has conducted sizing studies in more than 20 countries. He uses the data from these studies to help retailers and brands better serve their customers all over the world. We're going to hear from Ed, and then we'll move into a Q&A session. During the entire webcast, you'll be able to send me any questions you have for Ed by using the area on the left of your screen to type in questions. I'll hold these questions until the conclusion of our initial conversation and then pose them on your behalf. Your identity will remain confidential to the audience. You can also use this session if you have any technical questions about the webinar itself, and you will get a direct reply from our producer. Ed, the floor is yours. Jordan, thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we have a great audience today. Uh, thank you all for signing up. And um, I know you're all curious about the findings of the survey. Some of you have already downloaded the survey, which is great. Um, and hopefully today we can take you a little bit behind the scenes as to the whys and wherefores and, more importantly, what's next? What's next for us as an industry now that we know how so many of you feel about the gaps uh, that you have in your own companies, but you see in your suppliers, and you see in your suppliers' suppliers, and how are we going to better engage consumers as we move into this new age where consumers really own the industry as opposed to the industry owning consumers? So we're going to go through a little introduction. Um, I want to share an experience that I had earlier this year that uh, made me acutely aware of how significant this issue is here at home in the U USA. I mean, I see it all over the world, um, but uh, the, the movement of goods back to the USA, um, I, I'm on the board of the American Apparel Footwear Association. We just had a board meeting last week in California, and they presented some statistics to us um, that management did that were shocking to me. Apparel jobs in this country are up 66% since 2009. 2009 was the low kind of ebb point of jobs leaving the United States um, in apparel, and and we're up 66% since then. Now, granted, it's not a lot of jobs, um, but the other significant statistic we saw was that in 2009, only 2.2% of the apparel made in the United States uh, or sold in the United States was made here. Uh, today, that's jumped to 3%. And uh, that is billions of dollars of additional goods that are made in the United States. Back in 2009, it was pretty much all, for the most part, ferry amendment work uh, for the military and specialty niche businesses uh, focused on made-to-measure menswear, custom women's wear, uh, but nothing mainstream. I see that shift day-to-day uh, coming very strong in the, in, in the right direction as far as industry in the United States is concerned. Um, 
I probably won't have a chance to get into tariffs on this call, but um, uh, that may push us even further to reshoring more jobs in the future. We'll talk about the survey itself. Uh, this is the second survey. Uh, Alvin on did a survey of industry executives last year, the fall of 2017. Um, great response, even better response this year. Uh, more diversity in the response from management to director level to C-level. Um, uh, more age diversity in the response, and, and you'll see the results shortly. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a debate, perhaps, uh, Jordan and I talking about some of the questions that have already been raised and then how we might respond to them. And then we'll have Q&A from you all. So uh, looking forward to all of that. So here's the experience I wanted to share. Back in April, first week of April, uh, I had the privilege to join uh, 30 people on a tour of mills in North Carolina and South Carolina sponsored by the AAPN, the Apparel Producers Network of the Americas. Uh, we organized this tour uh, really to help retailers and brands understand what resources they have in this country. So this group of people represented people from Target, VF, VF Workwear, Academy Sports, Patagonia, Columbia, Full Beauty Brands, Superior Uniform Group, and Lacoste. And I have to tell you, it was uh, eye-opening for me to watch most of these young people see a mill in operation for the first time. We went to, this was our end stop. This was at A&E Thread uh, in Gastonia, North Carolina. Um, and I'll share a little bit about what I learned behind the scenes at all of these companies. I've been in manufacturing uh, for 40 years. So I've been to these mills. I've seen it all. I probably haven't done an extensive tour in 20 years. Uh, what struck me is uh, how in some things very little has changed, but how in others there's been massive amounts of investment in automation, especially when it comes to spinning. We went to Unify, the Reprieve plant, spinning recycled polyester yarn. Uh, we went to Parkdale, one of the largest cotton spinners, uh, the largest cotton spinner in this hemisphere. We went to Carolina Cotton Works, who takes the finished goods uh, and dyes them and finishes them and prepares them for cut and sew. And then we also went to Contempora Fabrics, wonderful fabric producer uh, in Lumberton, North Carolina, that takes that yarn from Unify or from uh, Parkdale and spins it into knit fabrics that then go on to, for the most part, Central America, CAFTA countries, to be cut and sewn into garments for U.S. companies. Uh, the one thing about these young people in this photo not one of them, except for a couple of the VF people, had ever been in a mill before. They were seeing things for the first time. And it struck me that we have this talent gap as we listen to the people in the mills. They can't find people. They can't train people who will stay in these jobs. Labor was the number one issue when we talked to the owners and the management at each one of those facilities that we visited. Yet, on the other hand, the people coming in from the headquarters were uh, woefully unprepared for what they were going to find. The, the really thankful news is that they all went back to their organizations and kind of preached the message of, we need more training. So um, I want to sh share one last story here. This was A&E. The one message that we heard from all of these mills that we went through was that we can't find labor. We can't find people. We are constantly the biggest HR expense we have is recruiting. We are always recruiting. Uh, and the thing I liked about A&E is, you know how in some companies, the first two spaces next to the entry door uh, are for the owner or the employee of the month or the president? The first two spaces next to A&E stores were for job applicants. That's how much they value people coming to look for a job because they can't wait to qualify them and hire them and then continue to train them. So labor is a big issue. So back to the survey. So we were very, very fortunate to partner with organizations worldwide who assisted us by sending out the survey information to their members, uh, both American Apparel and Footwear Association, AAPN, I mentioned, uh, and the IAF. I serve on all three of those boards, and, and we were happy to 
send these out to our members and, and, and get them to participate. Uh, ASBCI in England, Australian Fashion Council, Bob Kirk in the Canadian Apparel Federation, great call out there, the Textile Institute, Moden, Han Becca in the Great Dutch Association, uh, University of Oregon, and Carlos Botero, my friend at uh, Inex Moda in Colombia, and the California Fashion Association. Um, so we spread this far and wide. And HK Rita, excuse me for slipping her, my friend Edwin K. So what were the demographics of the group? So by management level, we had 642 total respondents. 64% were managers and above. 22% um, were below manager grade. So the one thing that we tried to get in the survey was a diversity of opinion. We didn't want management level telling us what their perspective was without hearing from the people who work for them. Likewise, we didn't want to hear from the people in the trenches doing the work without hearing what the perspective was from the other side. Um, uh, by geography, pretty good balance, 30% in the Americas, 30% in Asia, 15% in Europe, and 25% uh, in South and Latin America. Another bit of diversity, we were fortunate enough to have large companies and small companies. 18% of the companies were over a billion dollars that responded. 24% were under a million dollars. Everyone else, obviously, in between. Uh, by company size, 16% had greater than 50 staff or greater than 10,000 staff, and 29% had fewer than 50. Again, everyone else in between. Uh, so between the geography, the management levels, and the company size, we felt like we got a really good cross-section of the industry. Age was another important factor. It's interesting to get the perspectives when I travel of people who have been in the industry for a long time, uh, uh, as I have, uh, and people who have uh, maybe been uh, in the industry just a few months. Uh, I also have the privilege of speaking at a lot of schools, and uh, it's interesting to hear the perspective of students interested in coming into the workforce. And students are much more aware of the curriculums uh, in their school versus competitive schools today. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about training in 3D technology and pattern making design uh, and product creation in 3D in the virtual world. Uh, some schools are very much ahead of the curve and focused on 3D in their, in their uh, curriculums and some are way behind the curve. And that's really a disservice as we move into this world where virtual is trumping real uh, as we uh, develop products for speed and relevance to the consumer today. So 78% uh, of the consumers were 36 plus years old. Uh, so a lot of experience. We had uh, uh, only about a quarter who were below 36 uh, years old. And greater than 50% of the people that responded to the survey were in tech design and product development roles. By company type, 39% represented a brand. A third, we were really happy about this, represented manufacturing or factories. 20% were retailers. And 19% rep represented sourcing companies. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from in terms of your perspective in this industry, I, I think, uh, and, and this is really the big macro picture, we're in, at the United States at least, uh, an era of full employment. Uh, the unemployment rate is the lowest it's been since the 60s, the early 60s. And uh, there are a lot of people out there uh, who are happy with the jobs they have. They're not looking. And so finding the right talent is, is, is difficult to begin with. Training and retaining that talent is also a challenge. So what are some of the survey highlights? Uh, first, we asked, is there a sense of urgency? Well, 73% of the respondents said that employee learning and skills development is a key business issue for them. 62% say that they have difficulty filling certain positions due to a lack of a skilled workforce. I found it interesting, uh, as I read through some of the raw data in the survey, that there are employers out there today 
uh, both at the brand and retail side and at the manufacturing and sourcing side who expect skilled people to apply for the job. Uh, I was, I'm working with about five startups in the industry today, uh, mentoring and advising them, and all five of them have come to me and said, by the way, if you know of any 3D designers out there, uh, we're looking for pure native 3D designers, not someone who learned 3D, but someone who began in 3D. And I chuckled a little bit because there's very few people out there who have learned from scratch in 3D. Uh, so those positions may not exist the way some people expect them to exist. Um, and I think that's a challenge for all of us. Over 50% of the respondents were concerned with the lack of training and development opportunities. Uh, I believe this number uh, was more heavily skewed towards the uh, below management level uh, respondents. So uh, it was skewed by the fact that the people who are in less than management level positions today were more concerned than their management level counterparts about the lack of tra training and development opportunities that they saw in their own companies. What about the current state of skills in the industry? Well, 50% of the respondents have taken some sort of training in the last 12 months. One of the things that we've learned uh, from many of the companies that responded was that they have robust HR training programs, but the training dollars and the resources may not go to where the employees or the certainly on the technical and product development teams where they think some of the training resources should be spent. Uh, only 16% of managers claim their companies have done skill assessments of the whole workforce. Uh, I work with a company uh, that does nothing but executive skill assessments for either new hires or for management teams in terms of an acquisition. Um, and I see this a lot where skill assessments are done at the hiring level or the acquisition level of senior level people. Uh, but for the most part, Company-wide assessments are not done and not done on a regular basis. So we don't know what we don't know about the skill levels of the teams that work for us. Less than 30% say their company uses an internal learning management system. Um, I'll get to this really at the end, but one of the visions that Janice Wang and the team at Alvinon have uh, is to create that, to create and enable companies to access a learning management system uh, that's not just Alvinon, that's, that's really fueled by knowledge from all sectors of the industry. So whether it's textile knowledge, whether it's manufacturing knowledge, whether it's robotics and automation or 3D or sustainability uh, or corporate social compliance uh, issues, there needs to be a platform where we can go and we can learn as individuals or as companies uh, and, and get all of our teams up to speed on the same level. So what about the satisfaction levels and constraints? Well, less than half the respondents were satisfied with their current training and a full 30% expressed outright dissatisfaction with the current levels of training. The biggest sources of dissatisfaction were the relevancy of content and the time investment, time and budget constraints are often the biggest roadblocks to enhance training programs for managers. This is something I personally hear. This is something that we hear as, as a team in the field. Uh, when it comes to asking questions, Alvinon has offered professional development seminars for six years now where we send people out in the field to do uh, on-site workshops. And uh, the time and budget that are allocated to those uh, we find very challenging and our customers who are requesting this these workshops also find the fact that the fact they can't get time off or the fact that they can't allocate budget dollars for this is a very frustrating thing uh, especially when senior management tells us that this is a major priority for them uh, the employees rank lack of time and training materials as the biggest challenge so if you were less than a management level position uh, you didn't feel like you were allocated time to go for training, and you didn't feel like you had sufficient training materials. So what were the training needs? Well, 
When asked what type of skills were needed and not provided, technical training was selected more often than soft skills or management training. And I have to tell you, digging down deeply into technical training, uh, everyone on this call has probably been involved with or heard about or started working on some 3D uh, solution in their product development or design or merchandising or line planning or technical fitting areas or all in some cases. Um, and 3D training uh, is, is a major call out. Uh, one of the first courses that Alvinon launched, both in our uh, in-site, on-site webinars, uh, I'm sorry, our on-site uh, workshops, and now on our online platform, is costing. Uh, the thing that really struck me about costing was that uh, I don't think we realized as a company how few people out there in the industry really understand costing. At the headquarters level, we're more often than not focused on IMU and achieving it, and, and, and as long as a vendor is going to help us make our IMU, it, it doesn't matter what the FOB is and it doesn't matter what the landed cost is. And we just have to get our margin. And we don't know enough about how to drill down the, the details to ask smart questions, to be better negotiators. 70% of the business leaders believe more investment needs to be put into training. There you go, that, that dichotomy between business leaders they believe more investment needs to be put into it. Uh, they believe it's a high priority, but they're not doing it. The budgets are not matching this. Less than 30% have seen a budget increase in the last two years at a time when we've seen the gap in skills and education increasing rapidly. So those are some of the highlights. Um, a couple of things that... I will focus on here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jordan. Jordan's going to ask me a couple of uh, questions, and then we're going to turn it over to you, the audience, uh, to dig deeper. Uh, this comes from Harvard Business Review. Uh, employers aren't just whining. The skill gap is real. Uh, this was earlier this year in the Harvard Business Review. I can tell you from going on this mill tour, this picture here is from uh, uh, Contempora Fabrics, great circular knitting supplier in North Carolina, uh, a, a real survivor of Hurricane Florence uh, earlier this month and, and not completely survived yet, but um, it's an employee-owned company. So these people all pull together and they are back serving their customers. Um, they cannot find people. They are constantly searching for talent. Um, it's very difficult. They pay great wages, and the employees can be vested to become owners in the company. Um, yet they find it really, really difficult. They're not whining. The skill gap is real out there, and the people looking for good work, good, honest work, with a very good salary and good benefits uh, are just not there. And that's not the only place that we heard it. An interesting thing that struck me as we toured the Carolinas was that many of the uh, if not all uh, of the facilities that we toured have connections to the Barry Amendment and uh, military suppliers. So as uh, federal government contractors, uh, they m must make sure that all of their employees, employees pass drug tests before they're hired. Um, and that's one of the issues that they face uh, in North and South Carolina today that half the employees that apply don't pass the drug test. So their, their workforce pool that they can draw from is automatically cut in half because they need that in order to get them qualified uh, to be a federal government employee, a federal government subcontractor employee. So uh, that's a real issue today and something that um, uh, our government, our states, our localities, uh, and we as human beings need to address. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Jordan. Jordan is going to throw out some quotes, and, um, and we'll talk about them uh, over the next few minutes. And then we've already got some questions coming in uh, live from all of you, and, and we'll tackle those as we see them. So, Jordan, can I turn it back over to you? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ed. Thank you for those insights. Um, you kind of mentioned, and I'm interested, um, you know, maybe we'll get to this, but not only is there a huge 
skills gap, but um, something that I saw in the report um, that you touched on is that sometimes there's a gap in the ability to even understand what that gap is, which is a whole other level of um, knowledge that may, maybe we're lacking in certain places. Um, so it looks like um, we have a lot of questions coming in, but I will remind the audience if you have other ones, go ahead and, and keep sending them to us, um, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Um, a question for you, Ed. Um, at Tech Process um, this year, Frank Henderson, who's the CEO of Henderson Sewing Machines, um, said, our biggest challenge is the retirement of the baby boomer generation. The really big problem is the loss of knowledge when people leave. Uh, based on the current business environment, would you agree or disagree with that assessment? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. I've been in the business probably longer than Dirk, and um, uh, I remember in the 70s uh, lamenting the loss of older pattern makers uh, who were leaving the industry, uh, retiring, and uh, young pattern makers not having the skill level uh, to be able to replace them. Well, you know, we've made okay. We made out okay in the 80s and the 90s. We had a new crop of students coming out of, of technical schools. Um, I studied pattern making at, at uh, Philadelphia College of Textile and Sciences part-time, so I would understand the, 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 uh, the nature of pattern making. And don't ever ask me to make a pattern, although I did 25 <laughs> years ago. Uh, but... Uh, we did produce a great generation of new pattern makers who are, for the most part, many of our technical design leaders today. Uh, once you get promoted into that technical design management position, you don't have the time to be a pattern maker. And what we're seeing and what many of my colleagues are seeing in the industry is that fewer and fewer schools are teaching raw pattern making skills. Uh, and fewer and fewer students are interested in learning pattern making because there are fewer and fewer pattern making jobs. Um, so when I think of this challenge about the baby boomer generation retiring, uh, pattern making jumps out to me uh, as being the, that one area where uh, that's, to me, the DNA of a brand, to be able to understand who your customer is and to create a block library of styles, or a, a, a library of blocks that will meet the needs regardless of styling, regardless of trend, regardless of fabrication. Um, and you need real skill to do that. When we say to our uh, vendors, uh, here's the tech packs, these are the measurements you need to hit, and uh, your pattern makers in China or Bangladesh or Cambodia, or you guys make the pattern, just send us a sample. That's not enough. That's not enough to really control speed to market, quality, and, and true customer engagement when it comes to fit. Uh, so w when I see that quote from Frank, and Frank is a, a dear friend of mine, we serve on the Spisa board together, and we talk about this. Um, uh, pattern making is what hits me. Uh, if you ask Frank this question, he would say, we don't have sewing machine mechanics anymore. He's selling more and more sewing machines because there is more and more reshoring going on. You can't find anyone to take care of them. So as people retire, people aren't going to school to learn those skills, and schools aren't offering those skills. So, yes, this is a real issue, and we need to find ways to, to deal with it. Um, so, yes, I, I agree completely. Uh, so, you know, we're lacking these old older um, skills that have always been needed in industry like pattern making and sewing machine repair. Um, but then there's new, uh, there are new technologies that have come along sort of leads into the next question I have here. Have you seen a change in industry skill needs over the past 10 years and particularly as it relates to manufacturing? Uh, yes. So, uh, you know, we've been fortunate to uh, have, a whole host of suppliers to the industry, not just in the U.S., but around the world, who have recognized that we need to automate or die. And um, uh, automation has entered our industry uh, on the periphery of it. So we have, we've had automated cutting. We've had automated nesting. Uh, we have uh, uh, great design tools uh, that take advantage of new technologies. Uh, the soft part of it, you know, putting two pieces of fabric together and stitching it 
has not been successfully automated yet. We have certain functions that have always been automated, whether it's pocket making or placket setting or buttonholes, but, but putting a garment together with a machine or with a robot just hasn't happened. Now there's software automation, uh, doing a great job of, of spreading the gospel of automation when it comes to sewing, um, and making headway, Li and Fung made a big investment in software automation this year. Um, uh, Walmart Foundation made, made the initial seed investment in that company. So people believe that automation will come, and I think it'll get there. Uh, but between now and then, uh, we still have some challenges. I, I think the, the level of automation has determined that uh, we need people who understand technology and technology's impact. Uh, the fact that, you know, with Moore's Law, uh, processing power doubling every two years, uh, and we're on the verge of going into a 5G world uh, in terms of communication capabilities, um, automation is going to happen before we know it. And we need to have people who are ready and willing to accept that, not people who are sitting back and saying, you know what, the way I always did it is just fine and I don't need to change. Um, I happen to be at uh, the 3D Body Tech uh, conference uh, right now in Switzerland and uh, listening to presentations today about the 3D technologies that are coming on board, not just for apparel and sewn products and footwear, but, but also for medical applications. I mean, it's really amazing how much technology has changed in that area just in the last year. Um, you know, it just kind of, you know, blows your socks off when you see some of these uh, demonstrations. Is our industry ready for that? You know, I see a big gap between the technology vendors and the brands and retailers and then their suppliers, the manufacturers, those three triumvirate uh, areas, we're, we're not really putting the consumer in the middle like we need to. Because if we listen to that consumer, we would talk between brand retailer, supplier, and technology vendor, and we would kind of close the links between the three of them and have a more holistic view of how we serve the customer. Well, and do you think that these types of gaps and lack of communication between these three um, areas, I mean, is that, um, are these skill gaps and that lack of communication, are they unique to the United States, or do you think that's a problem everywhere? I think it's a challenge everywhere, but I, I see more investment in training in Europe than I see in the United States. Uh, I see more of an acknowledgement that when we hire people, we need to hire people with uh, uh, strong critical thinking skills, not just because you have a design degree or a merchandising degree, uh, you were first in your class or top 10%, you're, you're good to go, you're a warm body, we need you. Um, they interview for the other side of the brain skills where critical thinking is important because walking in the door and getting a job might be the easy part today because everyone is hiring, everyone's looking for people, but being able to build a career is different. You can't assume that just because you were good in what you learned in college and maybe did successfully in the job one, job two in your career, that you can do that all your life. Uh, my parents' generation, uh, if you had a job, you had a job for life. Uh, in our generation, uh, people have had three and four jobs. In my daughter's generation, people may have 10, 15 jobs uh, or throw it all away and say, you know what, I'm going to start my own company. Uh, there's there's 1.8 trillion of dry powder in the venture capital community. It's never been an easier time to start your own company. And we see uh, uh, older Gen Z and younger millennials uh, looking at the world that way. I was with a startup in California doing custom women's fashion uh, two weeks ago, and they don't know any limit on what they can do. And they're coming at the industry um, from a completely open mindset as to what they need to bring to the industry. All they think about is what I need to do to serve my customer. And if that means dragging your supplier, uh, dragging your technical people, dragging the technology vendor into the same room and saying, hey guys, we gotta solve this problem. Yeah, they're looking at it differently. Mainstream brands and retailers need to kind of break down the silos and look at it the same way. Um, we got to get people communicating if we're going to solve problems. 
Yeah, you make an interesting point about uh, the younger generations not expecting or probably even wanting um, to go into a job for you know a lifetime, and those opportunities really aren't available anymore, which sort of shortens the um, time period you have to you know adjust and like a job. Um, it's almost like we have to appeal to um, employees faster, um, which gets to that. My next question about, you know, hearing from manufacturers that there's this huge gap between what um, employees are learning in school and then what real life is like in the factory. And so that's a problem not only for their ability to do the job, but also for their happiness factor. Um, what could outside institutions do to better educate and train individuals to prepare them for a career in apparel? Well, you know, I, I think that you make a really interesting point because uh, 30 or 40 years ago, that same dynamic was happening. Uh, what you learned in school was never sufficient for what you were going to do on the job once you got out there. Uh, it was just table stakes. It was just, it's got you in the door. Uh, but, uh, back then, I mean, people realized that uh, they had to learn on the fly and learn from more experienced people around them uh, and pick the brain of every person in their supply chain or in their vendor base um, and among their customers and, and, and pick it up and learn it. I, I think today we're, we're in the same position and we, can, we just can't afford to be in that position. Uh, the educational outreach uh, needs to be acknowledged. I, I remember uh, growing up in the industry and, and doing just that, picking the brain of everyone who I bought thread and zippers from, uh, from every uh, cut and sew contractor that I gave work to, uh, and from every customer that gave us an order. You know, what can we do to, to make this faster, better, less expensive, uh, more value to you? Uh, and we collaborated. Um, I think today we're in this world that where speed is, is critical. We've heard this for years, but uh, we, we talk to people, and this, is, this goes back to the survey results that talks about the lack of time allocation to training. Um, everyone has a day job, and they can't take off any time from that day, day job to learn more or, or uh, go to a training class. And I think this needs to be a top-down acknowledgement on the parts of retailers and brands, owners of manufacturers, um, they both need to look at this and say, you know what, unless we upskill our people, they're going to leave. They're going to just move on uh, to a better opportunity. If we want to keep them, we need to educate them. Uh, we need to train them. And uh, we need to train them from the day they walk in the door. Um, likewise, if I'm a student today, if I were uh, – I lecture – it's guest lecture at universities um, – all over the world. And one of the things that I say to students is get yourself out in the factory. Um, one of the things that we learned from our friends at Lee and Fung, um, the, their merchandising team in Hong Kong, 2,500 people strong, um, their job is to take an order from a brand, a retailer, and farm it out to a factory or supplier who can fulfill that order so that the brand hits their IMU and Li and Fung makes a margin, and the factory makes their margin, and everyone goes home happy. But the one thing we learned was all of those 2,500 people are the best and the brightest from university in Hong Kong. Uh, almost none of them had ever been in a factory, which is one of the reasons we put a training course together for them on uh, very detailed apparel costing techniques. They, they just never led, led that life of being in a factory and dealing with uh, – fabric yields and uh, standard minutes and uh, factory efficiency rates. So um, luckily, you know, companies do get it. So Lee and Fung is one of them. It gets to invest to educate their workforce. Uh, we see other companies doing the same thing. Uh, VF Corporation uh, invests heavily in training their workforce. Target Corporation is another one. I just want to give a call out to the people that, you know, I know who uh, do a great job. I can't not mention Nike, who uh, invests a lot in training their teams. Uh, so uh, there are companies doing it, but even there are small companies who uh, are doing it as well, uh, who recognize that need to invest in their people. Um, because if, if you really want to build a successful business, 
you, you can't afford the churn that happens when people leave and new people come in and have to learn not only the job, but uh, uh, adapt to the culture of that business. Right. Um, we have a lot of questions here from the audience. Adam, I'm going to throw a couple of them in now. I, um, I, when somebody, a couple of people are wondering, like, are there, are there subsidies um, available from the government that can help with this, that can help pay to train a workforce? Yeah, well, there, there are some. Um, if you are a minority-owned business or a women-owned business, you have access to some funds uh, that are unique. Uh, but any company can go to the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, and they have something called the ETA, uh, the Employment and Training Administration. Uh, so Department of Labor, Employee and Training Administration, I think is DOLETA, D-O-L-E-T-A dot gov. And uh, they have a bunch of tools there uh, that you can search for uh, where you might be able to get uh, assistance in training workforce. Uh, they also have tools for assessing skill gains in, in a workforce uh, or getting credentialed uh, attainment goals. They also have access to e-learning modules. Uh, so I, I think that I would start with that, but uh, I'd also go down to the state level. Um, there's a manufacturer in North Jersey, uh, Suchi Ramesh, who has uh, built up a, a pretty good Made in USA story uh, and is serving clients with kind of on-demand production capabilities uh, in New Jersey and has uh, recently expanded her uh, facility with the help of New Jersey government. Um, but training is one of the things that she commits to her employees, and I think that that's a really powerful thing. Um, there are many, many examples of that. But uh, uh, state and local levels are, I think, often good places to start. But I would check out the D U.S. Department of Labor and the Employee and Training Administration. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sure that's helpful. Um, there's a question here that kind of touches on something we you know, hear about um, that all the really technical-oriented um, people want to go work for, you know, Google, um, Amazon, you know, Apple. And um, one of the questions here is asking, you know, where are the potential employees working that would be good for our industry? And um, where, how, can, how can we go about attracting that talent to the apparel industry and to, you know, manufacturing here in the, in the state? Well, the, the clothing and footwear uh, industries, as uh, the, the folks at AAFA like to point out, um, everybody, when you just walk out the door, there's no one who's not wearing clothes and there's no one who's not wearing shoes for the most part, unless you're in Venice Beach, California, perhaps. But um, everyone wears clothing and footwear. And I think as an industry, we can – make it more romantic to want to work in our industry. Certainly you have, you have passionate people who come out of school uh, who want to be a designer or who want to be a merchandiser. And those people are finding jobs uh, easier and easier to get. Um, I, I'm on the board of the University of Delaware's uh, fashion program, fashion studies program. And uh, in 2009, 2010, 2011, it was difficult for people to get jobs coming out of school. We were in the recession, recovering from the recession, not the case today. Uh, those people can get jobs. Uh, but I think we have to entice people with the fact that we have new roles for people. I, I want to uh, give Macy's a call out. Uh, Macy's has been doing a great job of recruiting digital talent. Uh, as retailers and brands re realize that they need to have, you know, omnichannel is so like almost last decade. I mean, uh, omnichannel is is basically entry to the game today. Uh, you have to have an ability to communicate with your customer and service your customer through whatever channel they choose to engage you. Um, but today it's about digital engagement. 82% uh, of all retail sales uh, in apparel and footwear and accessories are influenced by mobile. So what's your mobile strategy? Uh, I think the, the industry can make it sexy for students and young adults uh, uh, and older adults who have the talent and, and, and interest and wherewithal to apply for jobs where they can help that company develop a digital 
strategy and deploy that in, in, in a way that will better engage their customers. Customers have so many choices today. Uh, you know, as consumers, you know, we're bombarded with uh, text messages and alerts and advertising, and uh, you can't go anywhere without being followed by Facebook and Google and Amazon. And uh, they know everything that we do, and, and they know what we want before we want it. Um, so being able to take social skills and apply them to the clothing and footwear and accessories industries, I think is, is, is something that would appeal to a lot of people. And um, we as, as people doing the hiring in the industry, as brands and retailers or as manufacturers, need to make it sexy. We need to really tell people our story. And I think we'll engage people to want to come work for us. I mean, it is, you know, naturally a pretty exciting industry, I think, apparel and fashion. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard. Um, and I have a question here from someone who teaches at a community college. Um, he says they have two levels of pattern making and some various equipment. Her question is, what are, um, where are the entry-level pattern making jobs that don't require three or four years of experience? Uh, she says this is the most difficult aspect for many students. Um, they teach one level of draping, um, and she's kind of speaking your suggestions or comments on um, that area. Well, I, I think you could do a survey of, of companies that uh, employ pattern makers and companies that don't. Um, but if you look away from the brands and retailers for a second, where they are recruiting and hiring and, and less and less, and in some cases doing away with actual pattern making and uh, farming that out to their suppliers. Uh, if you look to manufacturers, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are reshoring more and more jobs in this country. And the one thing that I hear from cut and sew people in this country, they can't find pattern makers. And they would probably be very happy to take an entry-level pattern maker uh, to come and apprentice with an experienced person. Um, I, I would start with that. Um, and, and if you're willing to be a little bit more adventurous, uh, being able to go into a CAFTA country uh, or go into Mexico, uh, or go, Canada has a robust uh, manufacturing uh, program, or not program, but manufacturing companies as well. So there's still a lot of apparel manufacturing being done in this country. Uh, but rather than look to the big brands and retailers, um, look to either startups uh, or look to manufacturers. And I think you'll find opportunities for entry-level pattern makers. So kind of just connect, finding, finding the connection between the company and the, and the student. Um, this, is, this sort of goes to the comment I made earlier about the gap of not, not even knowing what you don't know. And, and um, we have a question. Uh, pattern making was formerly largely learned through apprenticeship um, type of experiences. Does the industry understand that, that the workload needs to allow time for teaching and learning on the job? Um, you kind of, you were speaking, Ed, about you know, how every, people often don't understand the training that's involved and, um, and need to move so quickly these days. Um, can you comment on that discrepancy between some things that just really require time and experience, which I think pattern making does, and the sort of need for speed? Well, in every company that I've been involved in, uh, from a manufacturing standpoint, we had our own pattern makers. And we would offer high, higher, often hire uh, young people out of school who would come in as an apprentice and learn. We expected that person to start working day one. Um, were they going to make mistakes? Yes. Were they going to look over the shoulder of the master pattern maker and, and learn as they went? Absolutely. Uh, they would be given assignments that were less critical um, to learn on. Um, and, and I think that that still happens in manufacturing facilities today. Um, uh, the thing that I, with a pattern maker, you don't come into a company and take time off to go to a class. Uh, you're, you're on the floor. <laughs> you're doing the work. Um, and it's being critiqued moment by moment by moment, if not production pattern by production pattern um, uh, or sample pattern by sample pattern. The difference, if you're working in the office in a merchandising or design or product development role, um, 
you're not learning on the job. You're, you're, you need to be taken out and taught some of the newest skills that are being uh, 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 expected in the industry. And, and there, you know, I'm really thinking 3D. I was with, um, I was at PI Apparel in Milan last week and, and listening to the 3D suppliers, whether it's uh, Browseware or Optitex or Clo, uh, uh, they're all lamenting the fact that, you know, they can't, they have great solutions they can offer the industry, but they can't just sell it to a company and sell a software license and walk away because they need to hold hands, they need to train, uh, and they're all changing their business models uh, from maybe two years ago to last year to this year to invest more time in, in training because if they don't do it, they've sold someone a solution which doesn't work. And no one really knows how to get the maximum ROI out of that solution or how to integrate it with other parts of their business. Um, and you can, you can have an analogy to the pattern maker there where, okay, I got my 3D license. I'm going to start using this. Um, big difference being that um, there, there are, whether we like it or not, there are still silos in, in most businesses. And you need buy-in. And you put a novice person uh, in a 3D application who has to deal, and they're, and they're in product development, but they've got to communicate with design and with the technical team uh, and perhaps the uh, line planning team. Uh, you, you need a lot of love <laughs> to make that work. So getting these people trained up properly, even if they've been pulled from their jobs for half a day at a time uh, or for a week at a time, uh, I think is critical. And I don't see that same challenge as much when I see a pattern maker going into a manufacturing facility because they're not leaving. They're on the floor working. And that's an interesting point about um, integrating that technology. Ed. Um, you know, when I want to speak with uh, apparel companies sometimes about software implementations, occasionally they don't want to share their story because they think the technology is a competitive advantage. But really, um, you know, it doesn't become an advantage until you can integrate that properly and, uh, and everybody can understand how to use it and um, it's part of the culture. So all of the competitive pieces really aren't just that, you know, actual um, piece of technology. You know, it's how you use it. Um, I have two questions here that are kind of on opposite sides of the spectrum. I'm going to ask you both of them. Um, and you can kind of take them as you want. The first one is how can manufacturing companies be more attractive to millennials? And then the other question is, what does the future look like for the older worker who comes back uh, to retain um, a job for a second career? Um, we have found that older workers are not hired due to age discrimination. So kind of the, both, both sides of the generational spectrum there. Well, you know, I'm, I've always been a kind of a glass, not even half full, but glass three quarter full kind of guy. And, uh, you know, I'm an optimist on, on both sides. You know, when I think about young people wanting to attract them into manufacturing, um, I think, you know, maybe I'm spoiled being from the East Coast, but in both Philadelphia, where I live, and New York, where I work, uh, I see these maker communities uh, cropping up everywhere where people want the skill of being able to make things. Uh, and there's this great, uh, there are, well, not just one, there are multiple in Brooklyn uh, where uh, people can go to learn how to uh, make almost anything. Uh, and uh, apparel manufacturing is cropping up. Uh, uh, the Pratt Institute, uh, Brooklyn Fashion Design Accelerator, great case in point where they nurture uh, startups who uh, want to manufacture. There's a manufacturer uh, in Brooklyn um, who I probably shouldn't name for uh, confidentiality reasons, uh, but he gets a lot of young people coming into his business who want to learn how to make things. And um, I don't think, you know, I, I think millennials and, and older Gen Z look at manufacturing differently and, than, uh, than, say, my generation. Um, on the other hand, we talk about the older worker. I don't think it's ever a better time to find a job if you're an older worker um, over the age of 50 or 55 or 60. Or um, I think there are so many opportunities out there where companies see that, uh, as Frank Henderson mentioned in his uh, question, they see that we're losing our talent. People are retiring. Um, I recently had a, uh, a high school reunion, and I was just 
uh, amazed at how many of my classmates were 63 years old and retired and, um, and unhappy <laughs> being retired. Um, I, I think that if you have industry knowledge and industry skill and you're open-minded uh, and you're willing to train and teach other people what you know, uh, there's tremendous value in that. And it's not because uh, the skill sets or the workflow or the process of going from idea to the garment on your back, uh, that that process hasn't changed. It has changed. Uh, but there are so much, uh, there's so much in the details that you can impart uh, if you are uh, over the age of 50 or 55 that will add value to any company. And I think hiring agents, uh, HR people recognize that today. I think right after the massive layoffs that happened after the last recession, 08, 09, uh, that was a very difficult time if you were over the age of 50 to get a job. I think that's completely different today. So, um, Ed, this is a question going back to something you said earlier about, you know, sewing machine mechanics and um, not having enough of them. Um, and somebody was talking about, you know, people were, a lot of people were laid off from jobs like that previously. Um, so now, you know, looking to the future, what would you say, um, you know, as automation um, takes over, you know, what are some of those jobs that, and, and then you, of course, you've touched on some of these already, but um, maybe if you can go in a little more detail, what are some of the jobs that you think will be around in the future um, in terms of apparel manufacturing? Well, I, I think that you need to, uh, if you look at some of the automation that's come in, um, it's almost uh, impossible to run a, you can run a cutting, uh, a nesting, cutting, spreading facility with one person today. I mean, automation on that side of the business has been tremendous. And, and the best manufacturers uh, in the world, uh, whether they're in Asia or whether they're in Central America or whether they're in Alabama, uh, are all investing in that type of technology. So your job is not going to be a spreader and a cutter. Those days are over. Um, machinery uh, improvements. I, you know, I saw a demonstration recently of Internet of Things sewing machines from Juki that talked to uh, CGS's shop floor control system. They kind of like, you know, blows your mind how the uh, factory automation, um, it, it doesn't take away the sewer's job, but it takes away a level of management because you've got automatic reporting and dashboards. Um, uh, uh, another great technology today is uh, there's a company out there called Inspectorio that has this great uh, platform for uh and started as just quality inspection in a factory, whether it was in your backyard, in your own factory, or in uh, uh, in Asia. And uh, it's a real-time uh, uh, platform that's powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, that creates this uh, network of information uh, that allows you to see uh, exactly uh, the level of compliance in not only your factory, but other factories around the world. I think you have to put a technology mindset in, into your head and just say, okay, where can I use technology to help make this business more efficient? Uh, and if you, if you go in with an open mind to technology, I, I think you find where the jobs are. Um, but the jobs are not going to be menial jobs. We've lost those a long time ago. And by the way, when it comes to sewing machine mechanics, just because we've automated many processes, it doesn't mean we, we don't need mechanics. Um, mechanics today make uh, five times the amount they made when we were in the heyday of sewing in this country. Um, uh, at Spiza, uh, we actually run uh, advancements in manufacturing seminars, workshops, uh, twice a year. Um, and uh, we have two courses specifically on sewing machine um, maintenance. And it's funded by the sewing machine companies. So th there are outreach efforts out there to, to train people for the jobs we need. Um, but I think people need to uh, educate themselves on, on what kind of opportunities are, uh, are out there. And, and, and I, I don't think you can pigeonhole yourself today and say, you know what, this is the job that I want. 
I think you have to look at yourself and say, um, I, I've said this to people who've worked for me uh, for 40 years, that I've always had this philosophy uh, that I lived by when it came to my, my work life. And my first goal was to make myself indispensable in whatever job I had, whether it was my first job as a stock boy in a school uniform company uh, to my most recent job as president of Alvinon, uh, make myself indispensable. And the second thing was make myself obsolete. Make myself obsolete <laughs> by training someone, training someone to be able to do my job so that I could go learn something else and do something else. And I've lived my life that way. And I encourage all the people who have ever worked for me, if, if any of you are on this call, uh, you know that I've said that to you uh, multiple times. Uh, but I think we all need to look at life that way. The world's changing so fast. Uh, once you've like mastered something, okay, what am I going to do next? That's great advice. Make yourself indispensable and make yourself obsolete, both at the same time. That's, that's great. Thank you. Uh, we have a ton of questions here, and we aren't able to get to all of them because we've come to the end of the hour. Um, uh, quickly, Ed, um, a lot of people are asking where they can download the survey. Um, can you can you share that? Uh, absolutely. If you go to the Alvinon website, uh, www.alvinon.com, uh, there's a link uh, there to get it. Uh, we will send a link after this to anyone who has been on the call so that you can download it easily if you don't have it. Um, the one thing I do want to do is if we could go back to the very end of the presentation. I, can you see this slide here? Uh, yes, can I can you, see it. On Motif? Okay, so um, as, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, Alvinon started investing in training courses back in 2012. Uh, Don Howard, uh, who is the executive director of our consulting group, um, uh, came to me one day with this idea that when he was at Ann Taylor, he was always asked to teach this one course on like Fit 101 to the designers and merchants so they would understand uh, the real mechanics of Fit because in many cases they understood Fit from a, a different non-technical perspective. So we put a course together. Well, he brought it to me one day and he said, you know, uh, I think our customers could use this. So we started with one course, then it became two, and it became 24 over time. And these are all these in-person uh, one- to two-day workshops for 30 to 50 people. And Alvinon's consulting team still does that. Uh, but what we realized that's not a scalable way to help train the industry. So Janice Wang's vision was to create an online learning platform. Um, and as we started to flesh out that vision, uh, we realized it's, it's much bigger than Alvinon. It's not Alvinon. It's, it's, it's the world. Uh, so we started bringing in partners. Uh, I mentioned Brooklyn Fashion Design Accelerator. They partnered with us with, with a course on sustainability and fashion. Uh, TAFTC is a great training uh, organization based out of Singapore that does factory and vendor training throughout Asia. Uh, we've partnered with them on a number of courses. Um, we're looking to partner with other people that we're in discussions with right now uh, to bring content onto this platform so that people can have not just Alvinon's uh, skill set, but, but a broad range of skill sets that cover every discipline in apparel. So I uh, encourage people to also just check out Motif um, and um, uh, just an, another great opportunity. Uh, I think we're, we're making this uh, webinar available to anyone who was on the call as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and please, all of you who are on there, uh, please encourage your colleagues to, um, to listen to it, uh, to read the report, uh, to contact us with any questions. Uh, it's something we are very passionate about, and uh, we are anxious to hear your questions. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be happy to... Uh, write email responses to anyone who is, I, I know we have a lot of questions on the, uh, the website here. Um, uh, anything that we didn't get to, I'll be really happy to uh, send out uh, a written response to those people. Great. I was, I was just going to say that we will have um, the ability to still access these questions. So, yeah, um, and if you didn't get your question answered, um, Ed, Ed's going to follow up with you. Thank you, Ed. And, um, also, as he mentioned, the um, webinar will be available probably in about two hours at apparelmag.com. 
So if you want to access it again or share it with your colleagues, uh, that would be great. And um, thank you so much, and thanks to Alvinon for sponsoring the event. Um, and thanks to our audience members. You guys really gave us so many questions, we couldn't even get to them all. So thank you for your great participation, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Great night.